I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Father, we love you this morning. Thank you for this great prayer that Paul prayed for us, that we pray for ourselves, that through the indwelling presence of the Spirit who lives in our inner man, that Christ might dwell in a way where we are rooted and grounded in love. Help us to comprehend with all the believers across all of time and those who are alive, the length and height and depth of the great love that you've shown us in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father, that when you save us, you save us to make us more like him, that we might be instruments of grace manifesting your goodness to a lost world. And so this morning, as we seek to renew our minds through Scripture, may the truth reverberate deeply in our souls that we would be changed by it and walk more closely with him. Give me strength today in all that I say and do, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Would you take God's word this morning and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 19? If you're new to the Bible, it's easy to find. It's the very last book in the New Testament. And if you're joining us for the first time, we are in a series called God's Prophetic Schedule. Typically, I go through an entire book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But right now, we're looking at God's prophetic schedule. And if you're, again, new to Scripture, even a casual reader of the Bible, you cannot miss the fact that God's truth is woven all the way through from Genesis to Revelation that the Messiah is not only going to come once, but he's going to come twice. In the New Testament alone, there's over 300 prophecies concerning his return from heaven. First, as he catches us up in the air, it's called the rapture, and then part of that program is he comes back to the earth. Of all the prophetic portions of Scripture, a little less than half have been fulfilled. So the vast majority of prophetic Scripture is yet to be fulfilled, and it's in reference to Christ's return from heaven, his magnificent reign upon the earth, and ultimately as he consummates time and we go into the eternal state. And as you read through scripture, you discover there are two pictures of the Messiah. He comes as a suffering servant, but he also comes as a reigning king. And very often, if you are with us in our study of Daniel and Revelation, in a single passage of scripture, both comings are found. And what many of the Old Testament saints and even the early apostles didn't initially understand is that there's a gap of time between his first coming and his second coming. God knew, of course, that he would come to his own, and his own, meaning the Jewish people, for the most part, would not receive him. Only a remnant of Jewish people responded. And so God delayed the kingdom. That's Matthew chapter 13. The coming kingdom is yet to unfold, but it is going to unfold. So we're between two great mountain peaks of prophecy between the peak of his first coming, the peak of his second coming, between that there's a valley, so to speak, known as the church age. And so there's coming a time when God is going to catch up his church, things are going to change, and God will switch to the Jewish people. The Jewish people will once again lead in terms of disseminating spiritual truth. In fact, the scripture is very clear that in reference to the second coming, Jesus cannot, he cannot come back for the second coming until the Jews repent and believe. And Jesus made that very clear, and we've been studying that in the Olivet Discourse. And so the spirit of prophecy is about the Lord Jesus. In fact, the Bible concludes with the final thought where Jesus said, yes, I am coming quickly. And John says, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. 
And so the Jewish people are going to return to the Messiah, all Israel, to use Paul's expression, all Israel will be saved, and then God will begin to unfold a new program. So this is where we're at. Jesus said, for I say to you from now on, you will not see me. He's speaking to all Jewish people. You will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the Jewish people are going to believe as a whole, holistically, the one who came in the name of Yahweh, they will acknowledge it. And so <clears throat> if, uh, if you remember, they're on the Mount of Olives. Jesus is about ready to ascend up into heaven. And the disciples asked a penetrating question. They said, Lord, is it at this time that you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See, unlike so many Christians today, these Jewish apostles believed that there would be a literal, actual kingdom that Christ would initiate upon the earth. And they are asking an important question because Jesus in this context is speaking about the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, when the kingdom comes upon the earth, there's a powerful movement of the Spirit across the entire planet. And so these men being drenched in the Old Testament scriptures think, well, maybe this is the time to which Jesus responds, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now, if Jesus was going to correct a false view, this would have been the time to do it. And so someone criticized me this week, and I'm, I'm used to criticism. It's okay. It doesn't bother me. And they said, you're talking all the time about Israel. I said, you cannot preach on Bible prophecy without making a distinction between Israel and the church. The church is not the new Israel. And while that has become the popular position amongst many Christians, Jesus made it clear, he's speaking to a Jewish audience, I cannot come back until you as a nation say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And just as God used Israel to bring the first coming, he's going to use them to bring about the second coming. And so unlike the reform movement that say, well, there is no literal coming kingdom, Jesus just said, look, you're consumed with times and dates, and you don't need to be consumed with that. Again, this would have been the perfect time to correct bad theology, and it would have fixed it for the next few thousand years. No, you guys understand there's no more kingdom. It's not going to happen, but he doesn't say that. He just says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even in the remotest part of the earth. What you need to be consumed with is the commission, the great commission, which is an overflow really of the great commandment. So again, here's the big picture, and this is one of the reasons we are doing this series on Bible prophecy. Here's kind of a schematic of uh, how things will unfold. It's a partial schematic. Uh, the next event, as you can see on this, is the rapture of the church. The word rapture is from the uh, Greek word harpazo, it means to be caught up, and there's a Latin translation of the Bible that was used for a thousand years, and they translate it coming directly into English as rapture. So we shouldn't say the rapture is not in the Bible. It's in the Latin Bible, and it was this key uh, Bible that was used by the body of Christ for nearly a thousand years. So the rapture is going to happen, and then there's a space of time between the rapture and this seven-year period. We don't know how long it is. It appears from Scripture it's a short period of time, weeks, days, months, but the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy and we studied this 70-week prophecy of Daniel in this series, and if that's new to you, you should definitely go back and listen to that message because it's one of the most amazing biblical prophecies in all of the Old Testament because it's a mathematical prophecy that gives you the time frame when the first coming will take place. That's why the wise men were so alert. They knew they were in the time frame of what Daniel had written about. But this 70 week, this seven year in Jewish chronology, they only, not only have a week of days like we have, they have a week of years. And so there's a seven year period. It's called in the Old Testament the time of Jacob's trouble. In the New Testament, it's called the Great Tribulation. And Daniel and John and Jesus divide it into two halves. The first half is bad, it's called tribulation. In the middle, there's an event called the Abomination of Desolation, which we studied. We did four sermons on that. 
where the Antichrist goes into a rebuilt temple, makes himself out to be God, and then it goes from bad to worse, and the great tribulation takes place. At the end of that seven-year period, small space of time, because no one knows the day or the hour, but then Jesus comes back to the earth. So first he comes for his bride, then he comes back with his bride. Now, while this seven-year period is unfolding upon the earth, better rendered reward seat, because the focus is not one of punishment, but rewards. It's the judgment of the just, and there's a whole message on that. God, as a saved person, if you know Jesus today, he's going to evaluate your life in heaven and reward you accordingly. And we'll see that this morning in Revelation 9, 8, of how the bride, the church, has been dressed in the righteous acts of the saint. We know this is in the future for several reasons. One is Jesus speaks of a resurrection of the righteous. Secondly, Revelation 19, 8 describes the reward of the saints of God. Um, in addition, 2 Timothy 4, Paul speaks that in the future, hasn't happened yet, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness that he'll give to me, and not just to me, but to all who love his appearing. One of the five crowns that can be awarded to the believer is expressed through a love for Jesus' return. That's one of the reasons I'm doing this series. I hope in your heart you will long for the return of Christ. And if you don't, there's a spiritual problem in your heart. And in addition, of course, a number of parables that Jesus taught and then some direct teachings is that your responsibility during Christ's rule on the earth will be indexed to your faithfulness now. So some will be over 10 cities, some over five cities, and so forth. After the judgment of the just, the Bema, there's the marriage of the Lamb. And so when you think about the second coming, think about it much like the first coming. There's the first coming program, and there's the second coming program. The first coming program was not a singular event. It involved Jesus leaving heaven as the Spirit overshadowed Mary's womb, took his eternal deity, brought together perfect sinless humanity in one person. He lived and was raised in Nazareth at the age of 30. He began his public ministry in Nazareth. He was soon rejected, left Nazareth, went to Capernaum as his headquarters, ministered for three plus years. At the end of those three plus years, he's crucified, buried, raised. He walks on the earth for 40 days after the resurrection, and then he ascends into heaven from the Mount of Olives, the very mountain the scripture teaches he's coming back to. And so that's all part of the first coming program. The second coming program also includes a number of events. First, he comes, we meet him in the air. Uh, we're brought into heaven. There's some things transpiring in heaven while there's a program that is unfolding on the earth. And one of the functions of the great tribulation period, again called the time of Jacob's trouble, is to give people who have never heard the gospel before in clarity and in power a final opportunity to repent and to believe. And it's during this time that Jesus can say, this gospel of the kingdom shall go to the whole world and then the end shall come. So what we're attempting to do, and we should continue to do it, we shouldn't say, well, it's gonna be fulfilled, so I can just sit on my hands. No, we are to be obedient Christians. We're to do everything we can in our power with God's strength and by his provision to reach the gospel, bring the gospel to the world. It is going to happen, and so John sees this massive group of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who through Jewish evangelists, 144,000 of them, Every tribe, tongue, and nation participate in giving their lives to Christ. And so the Bema takes place, but there's also a marriage that's made in heaven that happens during this seven-year period. Now, I suppose everyone wants to say, I have a marriage made in heaven. Well, there's going to be a literal marriage that will be made in heaven. It's called in our passage this morning, the marriage of the Lamb. And so first we'll be caught up in the rapture, then we'll see this morning we'll be dressed up as he clothes us in fine linen. And in the process, through the marriage of the lamb and the supper that will be followed, we'll be cheered up. And there will be many blessed days, great days that we have to look forward to. But if you are lost and you don't know Christ as your Savior and you die without him, you will not be a part of this great wedding. You will spend 
your eternity under the eternal wrath of God Almighty. Now, that's not God's desire. God's desire is that you be saved. But when Jesus comes back to the earth, it's one of the most anticipated events in all of human history. All doubts will be ended. All debates will be silenced. It will just be finalized. It will be the final apologetic. Every eye will see him. When we meet him in the air, just the church will see him. But at the second coming to the earth, every eye will see him. Every mouth will be closed. Now, beginning here in Revelation chapter 19, follow along starting in verse 7. John writes, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the li fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours, and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now the first six verses that I'll just briefly run through to give us some context this morning, they basically are a marriage announcement. When you uh, are going to have a wedding, there's usually an announcement that precedes it. And so these verses represent the marriage announcement. And there's a lot of praise and singing, a chorus that is unfolding. In fact, when Babylon falls, if you remember the broader context, chapters 17 and 18 speak of this place called Babylon. And there are two aspects to Babylon. There's religious Babylon, this coming one world religious system that will ultimately give its sole allegiance not to a multiplicity of religions that is being unfolded today, but to a singular religion, namely that of the Antichrist. And then there's economic Babylon, and the two are brought together because no one will be able to buy or sell anything unless they take the mark of the beast. And so we've studied both aspects of Babylon already in this series. Well, at the end of chapter 18, God crushes it. He destroys that physical capital in which Babylon has its headquarters. And so if you look back at chapter 18 and verse 20, an angel of God shouts, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgments for you against her. These are the people in chapters 17 and 18 who hated the people of God, who persecuted the people of God, who chopped off literally their heads for following Jesus. And what we read in the first six verses here of chapter 19 is their response to that command to rejoice. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Now, don't miss the context. Remember, the chapter and verse divisions are artificial. They're added almost for a thousand years after the Bible is complete. So whenever you see this phrase, after these things, and it appears throughout the book of Revelation, it's signaling you that there's a change of subject. And so the great tribulation has come to an end, and now the spotlight is on heaven and on Christ as he comes back. All the seal, all the trumpet, all the bold judgments are over. And so John has heard of the fall of Babylon. He heard something that he said is like a loud voice. It's interesting, this word, these two words, loud voices, phone megale. We inverse them in English, megale phone, and so we get our word megaphone. And so we're told that this great multitude creates this loud voice. Now, we were first introduced to the great multitude in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. Let me read it to you. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count. He's describing the work of 144,000 Jewish evangelists where people from every tribe, tongue, and nation are saved. And that's God's heart. God's heart 
is salvation. And one of the purposes of the tribulation is not just to bring the Jewish people to faith, but for them to take the gospel and spread it to the world. And so there's 144,000 evangelists that you can't kill. (laughs) They're indestructible. And God gives them the power and the authority and the ability to take the gospel to every language on the planet. And of course, God said through his son, God the son, for God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And I hope you know that that's why Community Bible Church exists. Number one, we're here to exalt Jesus. We're here to lift up the Savior. We live for the glory of God. Number two, we are here to edify the saints. And so I'm here opening the scripture because you can't be edified with my thoughts and ideas. Only through Holy Scripture can that build you up. And third, we're here to evangelize the lost. That's why we're here, to exalt the Savior, to edify the saints, and to evangelize the lost. And if a church is not engaged in those three things, They need to repent because they're not worth the real estate that they sit on. And so after these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's found four times here in Revelation 19. And by the way, it's found nowhere else, that word, in all of the New Testament. Hallelujah, hallel means to praise, yah is the word for Yahweh, for God. And so it basically means praise the Lord. And it's one of those words that is the same in every language of the world. And so, how many languages do you know? Well, at least you know one word from every language of the world, and it's hallelujah, praise the Lord. And so that's what they're doing here in stanza one found here in verse one of this song. They're rejoicing because they have come to believe that Jesus, Yeshua, is truly the Messiah. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. And of course, they are saved by the blood of the lamb. Look at stanza two uh, of this great wedding that is going to unfold. It says, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, verse two. Why? Because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot, that's Revelation 17 and 18, Babylon, who who was corrupting the earth with her immorality and, is he, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Now, we don't often think about praising God, saying, praise the Lord for him putting down evil. You know, most of the hymns today are expressive of maybe God's love or God's grace. But there's not enough hymns that maybe praise God for his righteous acts, for his holy wrath that will someday come upon the world. And so you may live in a setting somewhere in the world and we have foreign countries everywhere that are live streaming us. You may even feel ripped off in America that some courtroom did not do you justice. Well, one of these days, God's justice is going to be fully expressed. And so God will make every wrong correct. And so here are people in heaven singing hallelujah over the moral attributes of God because, here's the reason, because his judgments are righteous and true. So they're praising God, not just for his grace and redeeming them with the blood of the lamb, but for his righteous acts because he has avenged the blood of those who have been persecuted. Put out in the margin next to this verse, if you will, Psalm 19 and verse nine, Uh, If you know the scripture, you know there's two kinds of revelation. There's what we call general revelation, that information that God gives to every man on the planet. And then there's what we call specific kind of appointed revelation that not everyone receives, largely because they don't respond to general revelation. And so if you know Psalm 19, it's a Psalm of David, and it opens up with general revelation, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. No man can say, is there a God? Does God exist? Because his fingerprints are all over his creation. That's why never in the New Testament, unlike the modern church, no one ever in the New Testament spends one half of one verse defending the existence of God. If you meet a person who's an atheist, just lovingly tell them, you're really not. You know there's a God. 
They do. Why? Because his invisible attributes, his eternal nature, it's all seen through the things he has made. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. And then he moves to specific revelation in verse 7 of that psalm. Let me read it to you. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And then in the next verse, this is the verse that John quotes, verse 9 of Psalm 19. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. So no one can ever question or challenge the fact that God will only act justly because God's judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality, for he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. So here's millions of untold saints in heaven who are singing that great message. God has judged the great harlot. Notice the second quotation. By the way, if you're new to the Bible, when you see that change in typeset, at least in the New American Standard, different publishers do it different way, and it goes to all caps. That tells you it's an Old Testament quotation. And the second quotation is from the book of Deuteronomy. It's a partial quotation. It's part of the Song of Moses. The Song of Moses is sung on three different occasions in the Old Testament. Most memorably, when they cross the Red Sea, God splits it in two. They walk between a wall of water. Then Pharaoh and his army, who had evilly treated the people of God, they're all drowned in the Red Sea. And so he's quoting that and saying, just like... Pharaoh and his army cruelly treated the people of God. Even so, Babylon, unrighteous Babylon, would treat these, un, these saints in an unworthy way. And so they're praising God for his wrath. Now understand, at this point in the Revelation, if you know the book, no one else is going to be saved. Man has hardened his heart beyond all possibilities. No one else will be saved. Now, again, we don't think so much about praising God for his righteous, just acts, but we should. Look at verse 3. And a second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And so, again, typically we praise God for his love, his grace, his mercy, his glory. But here they are praising God for his unrelenting, terrifying judgment that is about to come for divine justice. And that's a good thing. God's justice is true. It is righteous. And by the way, it is entirely predictable. It's not whimsical. It doesn't fly off the handle like we might. It's totally predictable. It's always in response to sin. And so here they are. Look at verse 4. You go to the third stanza of this great hallelujah. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures, they're a category of angelic beings, fell down and worshiped God, who sits on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. Now, six times in the Revelation, you meet the 24 elders. And there are some Christians who think, well, there's just the second coming. We all go to heaven. There's one big judgment, and it's all done and over. And they very sloppily handle the Scripture. And then there are some Christians who think that we'll be here for the time of the Great Tribulation. When, as we'll see this morning, no, God has to take us up to prepare his bride to bring us back. And so we won't be here. And so who are these 24 elders? Well, the post-tribulationists or the amillennialists, both, they just say, well, these are 24 angels. These aren't angels. They're called presbyteros. These are elders, and they're sitting on thrones. You never see angels sitting on thrones. Sitting on a throne to rule and reign with Christ is only promised to the church. And elders typically are older gentlemen, and by the way, angels never age. And while angels do wear white and white garments, it's more commonly an expression of believers, and angels never wear crowns. Crowns are only promised to the church. And so if you remember back in Revelation 4, these elders who are representative of the church receive crowns. And there are five crowns that are given to the believer. And one of those crowns is for those who love his appearing. And so if there's not a love in your heart for the return of Christ, there's something wrong there. 
And so these are not angels, for that matter, neither is this the people of Israel, as some have tried to postulate. Israel has been under judgment. This is the time of Jacob's trouble to bring them to their knees to say that Jesus is Lord. These are God's men. Right out in the margin, would you, next to this verse, Psalm 106, 48, because I want to highlight two heavenly words that these 24 elders are using. Amen, hallelujah. By the way, in the Old Testament, this is a quotation from Psalm 106, 48, where they're brought together. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting even to everlasting, and let all the people say amen, and it's the word hallelujah. We interpret it, praise the Lord. The L-E-B, the Lexham edition says, amen, uh, praise Yah. And again, it's the word hallelujah. Now, amen is another of the most universal words. Hallelujah is perfectly universal. Amen, well, it's inflected differently. Like if you heard some of the Russians and Ukrainians who were here for our World Missions Conference, they don't say amen, they say amen. But it's still, it's the same word. And the word amen is used in two ways. It's used before a statement is made to underscore the importance of the statement, or it's made after a statement is made to basically give your affirmation to that statement. So for instance, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you that he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has this moment eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Those two words, truly, truly. Now, in our English Bibles, most English translations say truly, truly. Most other Bibles in the world don't translate the words. They just say, amen, amen. That's literally what it says, amen, amen. Why do we say truly, truly? Because it's a different usage of the word amen. It's put in the front. In other words, when Jesus wants to get your attention, 25 times in the New Testament, Jesus says, amen, amen. In other words, what I'm about to say, listen to because it's critically important. But when you place the word amen at the end of a statement, it takes on a different nuance. Again, words find their meaning in context, just like in English. A trunk, are we referring to what's in front of an elephant, what's at the base of a tree, what's over a sailor's shoulder, what's behind a car? All depends on the context. Well, when the word amen is used at the end of a sentence, you're basically saying, I agree, so be it. And so that's how it's used here. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah to the great truth that God had just revealed that Babylon has been judged. And by the way, if you're a little reluctant to use these words, this is the language of heaven. Now they can be abused and we can say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. When I go to India, they, they love hallelujah. They just say, hallelujah, and everybody goes, hallelujah. And I noticed when one of our missionaries from India was here, he said, hallelujah, and I think he expected a hallelujah, but nobody said anything, except maybe sham up there. Anyway, uh, but uh, in either case, sometimes it's abused. Sometimes amen is abused. Years ago, when we met over in the other worship center, what is our fellowship hall, we had a lady there one day, and just about every word I said, she said, Amen. I'd say something, amen. I could have said, Satan is God, and she would have said, amen. <laughs> I mean, she was just like kind of a blind amen. So I had to gently tell her, I said, you know, it's a little distracting. Look, if your heart is overflowing and you can't help but say amen, that's good. I don't like to uh, like force amens. It should come from within. It's an overflow, but you don't want it to be mindless any more than you want to use the Lord's name in vain when you say hallelujah. And so in verse 5, this is a command, and a voice came from the throne saying, give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. So this is a command, and it's, of course, it says, um, 
Um, a voice came from the throne. So this is not the voice of God the Father or God the Son. They're obviously not giving the command to praise themselves. This, no doubt, is one of the angels giving directions here to the millions of people. And the command is for these believers in heaven, these bond servants, these slaves who fear God, who revere God, the small and the great, meaning every category that man can create, the high and mighty and the unknowns, give praise to God. And then verse six, I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. This is the fourth and final hallelujah in this chapter. And John tells us that it sounds like a great multitude. I remember my dad as a young man taking our, his eight children, we went to Niagara Falls and we went on that little boat ride and I think I was about eight or nine years old. It was so loud, you just had to kind of shout to hear the person next to you. You go to one of these stadiums where there's 80, 90, 100,000 fans and they get all wound up. And I mean, you can hear it, you know, hundreds of yards away outside the stadium. That's really what's happening here. Like the sound of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder. All of heaven in unison is saying, hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Now literally the Greek text reads, the Lord omnipotent or the Lord Almighty has begun to reign, and that's important because there's a future dimension to the reign of the Messiah. We pray in what we typically refer to as the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He is literally reigning in heaven, but someday he's gonna fulfill every promise, and that's why the disciples, the apostles asked on the Mount of Olives, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Because God can't lie, he keeps all his promises. He will someday literally reign upon the earth. Now that's the wedding announcement. Now we come to the wedding. You say, I'm ready for my note-taking outline, Pastor. All right, pull out that pen, ready? Three truths about this coming wedding. First, the bride will be beautiful. The bride at this wedding will be absolutely beautiful. And there are a few events, I suppose, on earth more special than a wedding. And I suppose there's no more special day for you than your own wedding day. And throughout history, there have been wedding ceremonies and wedding attire and wedding, wedding celebrations in virtually every culture across the planet. And there's all kinds of purchasing and planning and uh, praying and, and maybe I should add stress. And then finally, the, the wedding comes, right? Uh, and notice verse seven, it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now another reason that we're given here to rejoice and to be glad is because the marriage of the lamb has come. And that's one of the reasons this great multitude is filled with praise because the marriage of the Lord has come. And very often in scripture, God likens the relationship of his people to a marriage. For instance, in the Old Testament, Israel is called his wife. Most of you know that at least from Hosea or Isaiah or the prophet Ezekiel. But in the New Testament, the church is described as betrothed, and there's a difference. Right now, we are only betrothed. The marriage is still in the future for the church. We are betrothed. And so this betrothal is about to change into a marriage, and so the imagery is going to change. You see, in Bible times, there was basically four events when two couples came, to, uh, two people came together. One is there was the betrothal. Then there was the formal presentation. Then there was a ceremony. And then there was the great reception or feast that followed. Now, we have a little children's rhyme we used to say and kind of edge somebody with, you know, we'd see two people who liked each other, John and Katie sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Johnny in a baby carriage, right? Well, understand, that's not the way it worked in biblical times. In fact, it doesn't work that way today, even amongst Orthodox families. It's not first comes love, then comes marriage. It's first comes marriage, 
And then comes love. And that's an important distinction. First, you make a formal commitment to a person that we're going to see betrothal is referred to. And unlike an engagement that can easily be broken, a betrothal was a binding agreement in Scripture. There are four people in the Old Testament who are called betrothed, and yet they are referred to as husband and wife, though the relationship had not yet been consummated. There is one couple in the New Testament that are described as betrothed, Joseph and Mary. Joseph is called the husband of Mary, but the relationship had not yet been consummated. And that's why when Joseph finds out Mary's pregnant, wanting to obey the law, he assumes she had been unfaithful, but because he loved her, he's going to put her away secretly. He's going to write a certificate of divorce. And so because only Jews practice betrothal, so the exception clause in the Gospel of Matthew. If during the betrothal period, before the relationship had been consummated, one of the parties was unfaithful, that relationship could be broken, the contract could be canceled. And so very often in biblical times, parents and rabbis were engaged in the process of bringing two people together. Remember Isaac and Rebecca? It says then Isaac took Rebecca, and she became his wife, and he loved her. He'd never seen her before. It was all built up, all described. He's described, and God brings the two together, and she becomes his wife, and then she loves him, and he loves her. And by the way, that's often how it happens today amongst Orthodox families. I was speaking to my friend yesterday, Hanak Teller in Jerusalem, and um, I said, Hanak, how, how many marriages now have you officiated over? And he said, well, over 200. And by officiate, they have arranged dates. And so you'll get a couple families together. And, of course, because he runs all these yeshivas and seminaries, a yeshiva is a male seminary. A seminary is where a female studies the Bible. And he has a special emphasis in working with a lot of seminaries where all these women gather to study the Torah and they will get together and they'll describe well you know I think uh, Isaac over here would be a good fit for your Bathsheba and um, they kind of put their heads together and then he's there's a special term for the rabbi who brings them together on their first date and if you've been with me to Israel before you look in these hotels and you see these orthodox Jews Jewish men young men in their 20s often early 20s and they're meeting a woman for the first time. They're in that public place. And many times after the first date, they get married. Now, they both have a yay or nay, but that's how it's done. I said, well, what's the divorce rate like? Well, he said under you know, one sect of Jewish people, they have a zero divorce rate. Under the broader categories of the Orthodox, he said, sadly, we have a 5% divorce rate. I said, well, that's better than America. You know, he said, yeah, you're, I said, we're 53%, 53%. And so that's what's going on here, is they're, they're betrothed. And so Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together to be with child. They're called husband and wife. And so, what does a woman do during the betrothal? What does a man do? A man leaves, and what does he do? He goes and prepares a place for his bride. Now, when the agreement is made, there's a purchase price. He has to be able to demonstrate to the father of that bride that he can take this young woman and provide for her. And so there's a purchase price. And by the way, when young couples come to me and they want me to marry them, I won't marry them unless he can demonstrate on paper that he can support her. And if he can't do that, I said, well, you know, you can go to the local magistrate and he'll be happy to sign your document. But I'm not in the business of marrying people. I'm in the business of building Christian homes. And I want you to be successful. I don't want you to fail. And so very much the same, there was a purchase price. And then he would go and prepare a place. And it was during that year period that the bride basically proved that she was pure and undefiled. Then he would come, there was a great ceremony, maybe we'll study this if we look at Matthew 25, 
with the parable of the ten virgins, and it usually took place at night, and so on and so forth, and then they go back to the father's house, his father's house, and that's when the relationship is consummated. So what did Jesus do? He agreed with the purchase price, and he reminded us of that great purchase price, did he not, at the Lord's Supper? This is the blood of the new covenant. With his body and blood, that's the purchase price. And he said, hey, look, I'm coming back, but right now you're in the betrothal period. And so Paul said this to the Corinthian church. He said, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Right now, just like the bride would prepare herself for her husband, the church is to be prepared for Christ. You know, you get into a discussion. I was in a discussion with a young woman and it wasn't like five minutes into the discussion. She told me she was engaged. I said, well, tell me about the young man. Blip, 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 blip. She couldn't stop because she was in love with him. And if you're betrothed to Christ and you're not looking forward to seeing him in heaven, either A, you're not saved, or B, Your heart is out of fellowship with God. Now, sadly, biblical prophecy is one untaught area in Holy Scripture. But one of the rewards that God gives are for those who love His appearing. Why? Because when you love and long for the appearing of Christ, what do you do? You get ready. You prepare your heart. You want to live faithfully. You want to serve the people of God. You want to live in holiness before the Lord. And so here in verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. And of course, the bride that is pictured here is the body of Christ, born again believers. And if you've taken my course on ecclesiology, it's available at the Institute of Biblical Studies, searchthescriptures.org. You know that the word ecclesia, church, is never used of a building, only of people. This is not community Bible church, technically. Now, we say that because it's a modern day usage of the word. We don't really go to church, we are the church. This is the meeting place of Community Bible Church. And collectively, we are the body of Christ, not just locally, but with the whole universal church, all born again believers. And so the bride is giving glory and honor and praise to the groom, why? Look at it, for the marriage of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. So another aspect of the betrothal was the price paid by the groom. In this case, it was the blood of the Lord Jesus. For the marriage of the lamb has come. He's referred to here as the lamb. Christ gave himself for the church, the scripture says. We've been bought with a price. You were bought with the blood of God. Please understand that when a woman is pregnant, the blood that is flowing through the little baby in her womb is not the blood that is in the mother's veins. Paternity suits years ago were determined by whether or not it matched the father's blood. But Jesus didn't have a human father. He was sired by God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God overshadowed Mary's womb. And the blood flowing through the veins of Jesus was the blood of God. You said, I didn't know God had blood. He did when he was here on the earth. And so Paul states it plainly in Acts chapter 20 that you were purchased, the church was purchased by the blood of God. It's holy blood, it's precious blood. That's the purchase price. He's left, where has he gone? To prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Mansions, the old King James says, the word mansion in the 17th century meant a room. Today it means something entirely different. In my Father's house are many rooms, you could say. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That's the rapture. He's going to take us back where? To the Father's house. And so this is the promise. He's going to come for us. He's going to take us to the Father's house. Why? Because he's prepared a place for us. And when we get there, what is he going to do? There's going to be a time of evaluation where God looks at our service to Christ. There's going to be a presentation where the bride is presented 
to the Father. Again, this slide pictures the big scheme of things. Uh, the rapture takes place. The bema, the judgment of the just, unfolds in heaven. And then the marriage of the Lamb takes place. Now, notice verse 8 here. It says, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So Christ's bride has been robed, the text says, in fine linen, bright and clean. Three descriptive words. First, fine linen. That speaks of an expensive, valuable cloth or robe, just like a bridal dress is often very expensive, and women want to spend many times a lot of money. Uh, it bothers us as men if we're paying for the wedding. But secondly, her bridal dress is also bright. It's the word lampos. We get our English word lamp from it. It's bright. It, 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 it's shining. It, it's, uh, it, in addition, third, it's, it's clean. It's pure. In fact, in Revelation 4 and in Revelation 7, it's described as being white. Why is it that in Western cultures, a bride will wear an expensive piece of cloth that's bright, that's clean, that's white? Where do they get that from? Right here, from the text of Holy Scripture. For the fine linen, here it says, is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, at first reading, that may seem a little confusing because all true believers know that you cannot earn your way to heaven. So how is it that the fine linen, these magnificent, clean, bright robes, are the righteous acts of the saints? Because in the Revelation, robes are used in two ways. First, of the robe that God gives you when you are justified. When God saves you, he gives you a righteousness that you cannot achieve. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, Paul writes. He said he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Unless you have the very righteousness of God, you will never see the living God unless you see him in judgment. And so Paul tells the Philippians his plan is to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own drive from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So when God saves you, he doesn't simply forgive your sin where he wipes the slate clean. That would mean you just have a, a clean slate. It would leave you with nothing, and you can't get into heaven with nothing. You need the righteousness of Christ. Not only does he wipe the slate clean, that's why the definition of justification, just as if you never sinned, is inaccurate. It's also just as if you had always obeyed. He imputes God's righteousness to you. The very righteousness that he has, he credits, he imputes to your account. And so in Revelation 7, 14, it says they have washed their robes and made them white, how? In the blood of the Lamb. But here in verse 8, he speaks of the righteous acts of the saints. So in other words, there is both the gift of Christ when we are giving his righteousness, but then there is a reward for your service to the Lord. And it's really Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 brought together. Most of you know that. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It, this whole by grace through faith process, the whole salvation process, is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast or brag. But then the next verse says, for we are his workmanship, poema, we get our English word poetry. We're God's poetry cre created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Why? So you can walk in them. So we're not saved by works, but we're saved unto or for good works. And so while good works cannot get you into heaven, and while they are certainly the proof that you have been made a new creature in Christ Jesus, when you get to heaven for the works God did through you, he will reward you. Jesus spoke about laying up treasure in heaven. He's not talking about earning salvation. He's speaking to his own people. He's talking about living for things that matter, living for things that are eternal. And it's here deemed the righteous acts. Now, God doesn't put you under some kind of pressure, some kind of saying, well, now I'm saved. Now I got to perform. Listen, I hope you are with us in the last two Wednesday nights. And the next Wednesday night to follow is the most important. You do not want to miss it a week from Wednesday. What God will reward you for is the works that he does through you. 
God is working in and through us those works that he has written beforehand that you can live them out. In other words, when you're yielded to the Spirit of God, and it's important that while you have the Spirit of God, that you are filled with the Spirit of God. So next time we're going to look at the four responsibilities we have from the human side so that the Spirit of God can fill us. But when we are filled with the Spirit of God, God ministers through us, and in heaven he rewards us. It's a beautiful picture. It's described as the righteous acts of the saints. But works that are done for your own achievement, for your own honor, and your own power are nothing more than wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment. And there's no reward on that day. And so the scripture speaks of this bride that has made herself ready. And what will follow, what the Net Bible calls a banquet, what the CSB calls a wedding feast, what our text here says, the marriage supper. God will robe you, not only in that robe of righteousness that he gave you at salvation by grace, but the righteous acts that he did in and through you. And this is a beautiful picture of the bride of Christ. Right now, we're covered according to Ephesians in spots and wrinkles, but not on that day. Right now, in many ways, we are despised and rejected of men like our Savior, but it's all going to change. The bride will be beautiful, all right? Secondly, the guests will be glad. Not only will the bride be beautiful, the guests will be glad. Now, remember, right now, we're just betrothed. Jesus is coming back to bring us to the marriage of the Lamb, and so the best is still yet to come. He's going to take us home. And I know the best is yet to come, not just because Scripture reveals it. I know it from experience. I mean, I think about my own wife. There's no one in this earth that I love more, that I am closer to, that I enjoy spending time with, than my bride. And yet when I think of the Lord Jesus and I think of the love that I have for her, it pales compared to the love that Jesus has for his bride, the church. And so the best is yet to come. Verse 9 says, Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. So when you are a bride at your wedding, it's a wonderful blessing to be there. It's an incredibly special day, but it's a potential great blessing for those guests that you invite. But in a Jewish wedding... The guests are not invited by the bride. To this day, they're invited by the groom. The groom invites them. And so he says, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know the word blessed in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Seven Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. Makarios, same word. It means happy, fulfilled, satisfied. Blessed are those who are invited. And of course, this is one of many reasons for a pre-tribulational rapture. You have to go up to the Father's house as promised. You have to be given your robe to be able to come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You've got to go up before you can come down. But with that said, this is a magnificent reception that is going to come. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, obviously, the bride, she's not the guest. She's going to have guests with her. He says here, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who's going to be there with her? Well, there's a lot of folks who are going to be there with her. One, all those tribulation saints who have been martyred, those who have acknowledged Jesus as Lord. In addition, the Old Testament believers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You remember what Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day? In that place, because of their unbelief, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out and they will come from east and west and north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. So passages like this affirm Old Testament saints, all the heroes of the faith that you can read about in Hebrews 11 will be there. John the Baptist, he's called a friend of the bridegroom. He'll be there. Jesus said of John, we studied it last Wednesday, truly, truly, I say to you, amen, or truly, I say to you, amen, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John will be in this kingdom. John will be a part of the great wedding feast. 
And yet John died on the other side of the cross, so while he had a unique relation with the Spirit, he doesn't have the same relationship that New Covenant saints have. And so these words, the ends, are true words of God. Why does he say that? I mean, of course it's true. Because he wants to give a note of assurance in light of all that the people of God have gone through, especially in this seven-year period. In light of all the mistreatment of the saints, we're up in the baptismal today, and we're talking about the church in Africa and all the hardships some of those brothers in Africa are experiencing and being executed. We've got a lot to look forward to. He's giving an added note of assurance. While it may seem too good to be true, it's not. Now quickly, and I'm done. Beyond the bride that's beautiful, the guests that will be blessed, there's the groom that will be honored. The groom will be honored. We read now, beginning in verse 10, notice, then I fell at his feet to worship him. Notice it's a small letter, though there are no caps or small letters, so to speak, in the Greek text. It's all caps or all small letters, depending on the manuscript. But we differentiate when the context is clear. So this is not Jesus. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. That's obvious from the context. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, of course, the pronoun him is not Christ because Christ is God. This is one of the angels contextually that he sent out to be involved in this whole process. But why does John fall down on his face at the feet of an angel to worship him? It's a good question, as I've given it a lot of thought. I just think he's just so overwhelmed emotionally. He's heard these great four hallelujahs like the sound of rushing waters. And he's just lost in the emotion of it all. And he falls down and he worships. Now he knew better in chapter one. Who does he fall down and worship at? The Lord Jesus. And of course, I suppose if one of God's mighty, majestic angels came into your bedroom tonight, you might fall down and lose your head and worship. So let's not rag too big on John. But this man is just this angel. He's a person. He's not a human person. He's an angelic person. But they are persons. Angels have mind, will, and emotions. Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus Worship him. You know, the Bible teaches you should worship God and to worship anyone else is sheer idolatry. And yet John worships Jesus. The women in Matthew 28, they fall at his feet and they worship him. The blind man worships him. Jesus never tears his robes like Peter or, John, or Paul when someone tries to worship them. He receives worship. Why? Because he is God Almighty and then he ends, he says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That is the very nature and purpose of prophecy is to testify to Jesus. Now, how are we going to apply this passage? Let me make some applications in closing. Number one, is your study of prophecy causing you to fall in love with Christ? Is your study of prophecy causing you to fall in love with Christ? See, the ultimate end of prophecy is not the what, it's the who. In the cults of our day, they make prophecy and they boil it all down to an emphasis on a what. But in Scripture, it's the who. The cults will try to come to your door to get you to believe something. God wants you to believe in someone and his name is Jesus. And let me say parenthetically, many of God's people when they study prophecy, they get lost in all the details and argue over maybe some, non, uh, some things that are not that cr critically important and in the process they miss Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The book opens, this is the apocalypse. The unveiling, it's the revelation of Jesus. And a right study of prophecy should cause you and move you not into something but someone to love him more fully. Secondly, I would ask by way of application, are you dressed in the right attire for the coming wedding? Now think about this. This is a serious question to ask and answer. If Jesus were to come back today, would you be invited to the marriage of the Lamb? I can tell you, you will not if you do not have 
the gift of his righteousness. On one occasion, Jesus is speaking about the coming kingdom and and he describes the kingdom through a parable and he uses a wedding feast to unfold its meaning. And if you know the parable, the king pictures God the Father and the son pictures Jesus Christ, God the Son, and, and many are invited, many religious people, but they have all kinds of excuses just like people today. So he sent them out and the rest represent the Gentiles, the despised, the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And in the parable, one guy shows up who's not dressed in the proper attire. And Jesus says, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. My wife and I were in Washington, D.C. one Sunday, and we got an Uber to drive us to church. And as we got in that man's car, he had Christian music playing. I thought, oh, this is interesting. It was was evangelical Christian music. I said, oh, are you a Christian? He said, well, I'm a Roman Catholic. I said, oh, that's great. I said, can I ask you a question? And in the course of the conversation, I said, I'm giving you the bottom line. It didn't all go down this fast, you know. On a scale of zero to 100, zero I don't know, a hundred, I'm sure. How certain are you if this were your last day on earth that you'd go to heaven? Without answering, he said, let me ask you a question. I said, sure. He said, if God is a God of love, and I believe he is, I think everyone will go to heaven. But without making a long story longer, I basically said to him, look, you have innately a sense of right and wrong, what's just and what's unjust. And I gave him some illustrations of something evil and heinous had been done to him. And I said, you would want justice because you're made in the image of God. That's why you know the difference between right and wrong, what's just, what's unjust. God wrote his law into your spiritual DNA, Romans 2.15 says. And God is loving, as you said, but he's just. And he will punish sin, but you can receive the one who took that punishment for you in your place. But if you ignore him or reject him, you will leave God absolutely no choice but to face the eternal wrath of God. I can tell you this morning on the authority of this book that you will not be invited to the marriage of the Lamb followed by the marriage supper of the Lamb unless you've received Jesus as your Lord. And you must hate your sin. There must be a disdain for what God calls wrong, and you must put your trust, your full weight, your full confidence in the one who died, was buried, and was raised for you. And if you will do that, You'll be given a robe of righteousness. The Spirit of God will regenerate you on the inside. You'll become a new creation. He'll help you to live for Christ and to serve him. And in heaven, he'll reward you for that. So would you be invited? And if you are one that will be invited, what kind of robe are you making for that coming day? Our Father, we love you and thank you for incredible grace. We deserve nothing but wrath, but you in your mercy came to rescue us through your Son. And thank you that we who are betrothed to him, that he will come again for us. He will take us to the place that he has prepared for us, and we will be with him forever. In the interim, help us to depend upon the Spirit whom you have sent as our comforter, as our helper that we might serve him well. Help someone today, Father, who's not really sure that heaven is their home, that they've been given this gift of righteousness. Help them to acknowledge that they cannot earn it or merit it, that they cannot save themselves. Help them in simple childlike faith to say, Lord Jesus, save me. And give them the courage to make an unashamed confession of their faith. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? You may be in Grays, you may be in Graniteville, you may be here. 
but there's a decision of some public expression you need to make. You've received Jesus as Lord. You've never made it public. You have an opportunity this morning. We don't ask you to give a speech, but you come to this front row and you're standing here when you're introduced and saying, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. And if you're not ashamed of him, I won't be ashamed to baptize you. You say, Pastor, I've been baptized already after I was saved as a symbol of my salvation. Well, are you a member of a New Testament church? You need to be. Every believer should be a member of a New Testament Bible-believing church. And if we can be that church for you, we invite you to come as well. So Matt's going to lead us in this hymn of invitation. If you have